Hey everyone, I'm Adam Harrington, exploring McConnell's Mill State Park in Western Pennsylvania today. And if you've never been here, I highly encourage you to add this particular land to your list. Deep hemlock lined ravines, sandstone boulders, sandstone cliffs, ancient glacial activity that sculpted this land, white water that runs through it, unique plant, mushroom, tree, animal communities, and the list goes on and on and on. And I really like exploring this area in the winter months, particularly in January, because you know, in Pennsylvania, we live in the temperate regions. A lot of deciduous forests are dying back, losing their leaves, and turning brown. But not so here. You know, a lot of eastern hemlock trees, Suga canadensis, line this ravine, line Slippery Rock Creek on the east and west side. So a lot of greenery can be observed in the canopy, but also if you look around me, in the understory as well. So we're not really gonna focus on the greenery in the canopy today. We're gonna focus on the greenery in the understory by looking at two plants in particular. We're gonna look for two plants that I'm really excited to find. I found them a couple months ago and I'm hoping they're still here today. And these ones are not only native, they're not only valuable members of the community here at McConnell's Mill State Park, but they might also hold value medicinally. So stay tuned, let's go see what we can find and hope to discover these two plants. Okay, so I found the first plant in exactly the same spot that I thought it would be. And I'm actually under a towering hemlock tree right now, but we're not gonna focus on the trees, we're focusing on the understory. So we're gonna put all our attention on this plant. This is sharp lobed hepatica, or anemone acutiloba. This is a plant that, more than other plants, remind me of spring. Why does it remind me of spring? Well, this is one of the first spring wildflowers to appear. You'll see it appearing in March, even with snow on the ground. It's got dainty, white, pinkish, light blue, purplish flowers that have five to 11 sepals, but they look like petals. And you're not really gonna see the leaves with them. You usually see the flowers preceding the leaves. It also reminds me of spring because these leaves that I'm seeing right now are persisting from last year's spring. So after the flowers die back, the new leaves appear. They persist through summer, through fall, through winter. Then these will die back when the new flowers appear. And so in March, in April, in May, in the next coming months, if I do find the flowers, those leaves that will appear will persist all through next year's growing season. I'll come back and I'll find them next year. Now you can find these in summer and fall, but you usually see these leaves, or at least observe them, more conspicuously in the winter. Because remember, a lot of the greenery is dying back, so the understory really starts popping this time of year. The Latin name is anemone acutiloba, which means windflower, that's what anemone means. And then acutiloba means pointed lobes. If you look at this leaf, this is actually one leaf right here with three pointed lobes. It's not three leaflets, it's one leaf with three pointed lobes. Compare or contrast this to a close relative, which is the round lobe hepatica, which grows around here. The round lobe hepatica has rounded lobes. That's anemone americana. This plant is in the buttercup family, or ranunculaceae. You know, typically find this in eastern North America. You'll find it on upland woods and rocky slopes, and that's where I am right now. Now, another name for this plant is liver leaf. And some people just shorten sharp lobe hepatica to just hepatica. So we see this whole liver theme going on. Where does that come from? Well, it probably comes from the doctrine of signatures, which theorizes that plants that resemble certain body parts should be able to treat those body parts. And if you look at the leaf of hepatica, it's divided into lobes. The liver is divided into lobes. These leaves are green when young, but they start to turn reddish purplish. You often see that modeling appearance on some of these hepatica leaves. And the liver is purplish reddish, so the colors resemble one another. Now, this plant had been used by various cultures medicinally. For example, the Greeks utilized this plant. Various cultures here in North America utilized this plant for dysentery, for coughs and astringent. And settlers here in North America utilized this plant throughout the 1700s and the 1800s. And in 1883 alone, it had been reported that over 450,000 pounds of liver leaf or hepatica had been harvested to be used in medicinal formulations. And perhaps the most popular medicinal formulation was Dr. Rogers Compound Tar Syrup. This is a product marketed throughout the 1850s, 1860s, really successfully as well. It was very popular. A lot of people bought this product before I think the company went out of business. Who knows why? But if you look at old advertisements, you will see that this product, which contained liver leaf, was marketed, and I'm quoting the advertisement, for the complete cure of coughs, colds, influenza, asthma, bronchitis, the spitting of blood, and all other lung complaints tending to consumption. So essentially, liver leaf is being touted as a cure for tuberculosis. Now, unfortunately, there's not a lot of current medical research being performed on liver leaf, but if you look at old ethnobotanical records, you'll see that various cultures utilize this plant probably successfully, and it's probably modern herbalists using this plant as well. Which is probably more to hepatica than many of us realize. Anyway, check out this plant, hepatica liver leaf, anemone acutiloba, on your next walk through the woods, and don't forget to come back in the springtime to see it in all of its flowering beauty. 
Okay, so I did successfully locate the second plant, and it's right where I thought it would be. This is a club moss, and you can see I am in a whole colony of club mosses right now. This is one species in particular. This is the shining club moss, or shining fir moss, Cuperzia lucidula. Club mosses, they're ancient plants. These things evolved over 400 million years ago. It's one of the earliest groups of vascular plants, meaning they have specialized tissue of xylem and phloem to transport water, sugars, and minerals. And they call it a club moss because some of these club mosses, there are many, many different species here in Pennsylvania, some of them have club-like structures near the top known as stroboli. They're typically yellowish. And they kind of resemble mosses. However, mosses are bryophytes. Those are non-vascular plants. These ones are vascular, so there's differences between the two. This one, as I said, is Huperzia lucidula. We have another one here in Pennsylvania, Huperzia parophylla. But I'm in western Pennsylvania. You're only really going to find Huperzia parophylla in the northeastern part of the state. This one typically grows in moist, shaded woodlands, mixed coniferous and deciduous woodlands. And that characterizes McConnell's Mill State Park. So this one is about five to seven inches tall. It's a perennial evergreen that somewhat resembles a mini fir tree. So if you look really closely, it looks like fir trees coming up out of the ground. And they typically grow in colonies like this. Like I'm swimming in a colony right now. You don't really find one plant here, one plant way over there, another one way up there, another one way down there. You'll typically find a big colony. You might have to walk maybe another quarter mile, half a mile before you see another massive colony. But on the east and west side of Slippery Rock Creek right here, you'll typically see many colonies of Huperzia lucidula. Now club mosses, including Huperzia lucidula, they're unique in that they don't have seeds, they don't have flowers. So how do they reproduce? Well, they reproduce through spores. Remember, some of these club mosses have those club-like structures known as stroboli, located at the top of the stem. These are from where the spores are dispersed. Huperzia lucidula does not have those differentiated stroboli. Something unique about this plant is that they contain sporangia, these yellow structures located in the leaf axils. This is one of the key identifying characteristics for this plant. It contains sporangia, those yellow structures, from where the spores are dispersed. Spores are dispersed, it could take three to five years for them to germinate though, once they land in a suitable environment. Now what's really unique about Huperzia lucidula shining club moss is that, unlike many club mosses, this one has a backup plan, or a plan B. Or maybe it's a plan A, who really knows? But it doesn't just reproduce through spores, it reproduces vegetatively through structures known as gemmae, located in the leaf axles. These are located in pseudo whorls. They look like spoons, spoon-shaped leaves, in the axles of these plants. They're formed in the summer, they're formed in the fall, and they blow away. If they land in a suitable environment, they can take root there and turn into a new plant that is genetically identical to the parent plant. So spores, if they germinate, those new plants will be genetically distinct. If the gemmae germinate, they turn into a plant that's genetically identical to the parent plant. So two ways for this plant to reproduce, pretty unique for Huperzia lucidula. Think of a succulent plant. If you break off a leaf from a succulent and you pot it in a new plant, it'll turn into a new plant that's genetically identical. Kind of the same thing's going on with Huperzia lucidula right here, but it doesn't happen with all club mosses. They reproduce through spores, but this one can also reproduce the gemmae. Now before we move forward, I just want to point out that this plant right here is not Huperzia lucidula. This is a yew plant which is Taxus canadensis. This is uh, somewhat toxic, although there are limited edible parts for this plant. Somewhat toxic, we're gonna consider this a toxic plant. Just wanna point that out there that if you're trying to harvest any plants in this general area, you don't wanna be harvesting Taxus canadensis unless you really, really know what you're doing. Having said that, let's continue on with Huperzia lucidula. So there's something really interesting about this plant beyond the fact that it reproduces vegetatively and it reproduces through spores. This plant contains a medically important compound known as Huperzine A. Have you ever heard of Huperzine A? Where does that compound come from? Well, Huperzia lucidula, Huperzine A. Might Huperzine A come from a Huperzia species? And it does. If you ever go to the health food store, if you ever look in the supplement aisle or you order online looking for memory enhancing supplements, you're probably going to find Huperzine A. This is a very medically important compound, a well-studied compound as well. Being studied for its role in treating Alzheimer's disease. Now this compound, if you're gonna find it in the market, it's being isolated from a related species, which is Huperzia serrata. This plant does not grow here in Pennsylvania. We only have at least two species, Huperzia lucidula and Huperzia parophylla. We don't have Huperzia serrata. So most of the Huperzine A on the market is being isolated from that species. But the research shows that all members of the Huperziaceae family, and the shining club mosses in that family, do contain Huperzine A. So what is this compound? Huperzine A is an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. What the heck is that? Well, most Alzheimer's disease drugs on the market, put out by the pharmaceutical companies, are acetylcholine esterase inhibitors. 
Acetylcholine esterase inhibitors inhibit the enzyme acetylcholine esterase, whose responsibility is to break down acetylcholine. So by inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, you're keeping acetylcholine in the brain longer. Acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter implicated in memory and learning. And so if you're keeping that in the brain longer, you're increasing its effects, increasing its duration, you could see why it might be helpful in treating memory disorders, especially Alzheimer's disease. And that's what the research shows. You know, there are many studies, many clinical trials and meta-analyses utilizing over 100,000 human participants showing that it may be effective in treating symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Now, of course, there are detractors for these studies. And of course, you're always going to hear that more research needs to be done. But that's just a given when you're looking at natural medicine and natural plants. But remember that Huperzine A is being isolated from a related plant, Huperzia serrata. However, this plant does contain that compound. So Huberzia lucidula, look for it in your next walk through the woods. You'll find it in moist shaded woodlands with coniferous trees and deciduous trees. Remember, this plant does not contain seeds. It doesn't contain flowers, but it seems to contain medicine. And what's not to love about that? Well, hey, we're going to stop right there for the day. I found the two plants that I was looking for. I hope you learned something today. And I'm encouraging you, even though it is the winter months, or if it is the winter where you live, don't stop the botanizing. Keep it up. Don't stop. Don't quit. Interact with the land as much as you possibly can. You've always got my support. Thanks for watching this video, truly appreciate it. I encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can head on over to Learn Your Land, join the email newsletter. Follow me on social media, I got Facebook, Twitter, and brand new Instagram account, the handles at Learn Your Land. Thanks again for watching this video. I'll see you on the next one.